Thanks for joining us for another episode of DPC Radio. This episode was recorded live in Amsterdam at the Dutch PHP Conference 2012. For more information about the Dutch PHP Conference, visit our website, phpconference.nl. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Smith. This is SPL in the Wild. If you didn't come here to hear about SPL, you're in the wrong room. There are a couple more talks going on right now. Uh, this is my first European conference, so forgive me if I jump up and down a little bit. I'm very nervous. Um, so, I noticed in the program this was marked as a beginning talk. This is not really a beginning talk for SPL. If you don't know what SPL means, if you've never used SPL anywhere, you may get a little bit lost. Uh, this is actually um, a talk that has been evolving for me. It started as a very simple talk on what is SPL and how to use it, because nobody knew what it was. The first time I gave a talk like this, I said, who in this room has ever used SPL? And no hands went up. OK, who in this room has used SPL? That's wonderful to see. Between 2009 and 2012, you know, the difference is amazing. And I love to see that. So we're going to look at actual uses of SPL that are happening right now in the PHP world, primarily from GitHub code. And the reason we're going to do this is we're going to look at ways that you can incorporate some of their ideas into your code. Because the biggest question I get when people say, well, what do I do with SPL? I don't know how to use it. I have no examples of it. There are examples out there. You just have to know where to look for them. As I said in the beginning keynote, you know, uh, we love to get joined in feedback. This is a really easy way to get to my joined in talk. You got a phone, click it. Uh, all right. So PHP has the standard PHP library, SPL. You all know what it means, so I don't have to go into a whole lecture about that. Uh, when PHP 5 came out, there were some people in the community who said, you know, we need to have some some standard objects and ways of doing things that other languages have. Uh, primarily Java is where a lot of these ideas came from. But there are some other uh, ideas and implementations pulled from other languages. Uh, the number one thing I always hear, but isn't SPL an extension? I, I can't depend on an extension. If you have a PHP running right now and SPL is not in it, uh, they've done some really nasty hacking. Because as a 5.3, you can't even turn it on off without actually going into the make files and screwing with them. So we're going to talk about some of the SPL features. And the first one is autoload. And primarily, don't use the autoload function in PHP. Everybody should be using, of course, SPL autoload register. So you're going to have a stack of different callbacks for loading your, your classes that you can use. Let's see if I can get it to show up. Here we go. Here is a really, how many of you heard of the, uh, the PSR0? Anybody in here? Yes? So we have a PHP standards group. Guess what they're recommending to use for autoload? Right here, SPL autoload register. This is the way you should be telling whatever application or project you're writing, this is how to do it. Uh, my slides will be online as soon as I can upload them after this so you can look at this yourself. But there are some excellent examples of how to actually do this. Now you'll see this is actually part of the class. When you call register, it's putting it on the stack. When you call unregister, it's taking it off. Uh, if you've ever used SPL autoload register, you know that it is called um, in the order you put them on. So you do sometimes have to be careful with that in your program. So there are two functions in SPL that involve SPL autoload that you should never, never, ever really use because they will totally break your program. Those two are the SPL autoload and the SPL autoload extensions. So SPL autoload is the basic default loader. It isn't really PSR compliant, and it has some strange things that work that probably shouldn't work. Uh, so how many of you have used namespaces in any of your PHP code? Anybody going there? Yes. So the automatic SPL loader here will take any namespace and use it as a directory name. And that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. And the other issue is it'll work differently on Linux and on, Unit and on Windows and other things. So you have to be careful. The other thing is SPL autoload does uh, lowercase all your, your uh, 
paths. So if you're on a file system that is case sensitive, you're going to break if you're using the default SPL autoload. So try not to use it. Write your own. It's more efficient. So here's some more examples of people who are using the SPL autoload stack. This is a, actually an open source project, Vanilla Forums. That's not what I want. Where is Safari? There we go. Sorry, I'm not used to this Mac yet. It's kind of brand new for me. All right. So if any of you have ever heard of this project, it's a pretty big uh, forum. It's been rewritten a lot for 5.3. It has a lot of new features put into it. And one of the things it has is it although it does it in a global space, it is very careful to use the SPL auto load functions when you get down here, if you can see it. Oh, ha, 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 ha. I can't scroll on the screen. Anyway, if you go look at this later, they have a very clever but unusual method of doing the autoloading that's doing it in a functional manner, which is not something you see a lot with SPL autoload, but you do need to remember that you can use a, a global function or even a closure or any kind of callback that you want to put in there. It's not limited to just a method in a class or something like that. All right. So the other thing PHP SPL provides is specialized exceptions. Now when exceptions were first introduced to PHP, the thing a lot of people did is you have an exception for whatever library or application or whatever you're doing. Just a big catch-all exception. If I have, if I have a, some kind of a library, let's say, oh I don't know, I have an HTTP request library, then I have an HTTP request exception. But that exception doesn't give you very much information, really. I mean, you can try and go and parse through the messages to figure out what went wrong, or maybe put a code in it. But that's generally not the way the rest of the world really works with exceptions. The way they do it is they have some kind, something called like a domain exception. So our exceptions are going to give us a little bit more information about the exception itself without having to go through and look at the code or the message or a trace back in the exception itself. The other nice thing is if you subclass them instead of by what they belong to, a library, by what they're doing, you can handle different groups of errors in different ways. Say you have an HTTP request class and you have an exception that's doing something with your 400s or your 300s or whatever you're getting back then you have an easy way to handle all of those in the same way by catching the right exception instead of going through and trying to figure out what actually happened in your code. Uh, SPL has two big chunks. We have our logic exceptions and our runtime exceptions. And everybody's like, runtime in PHP, really? The general rule for these rule, everything in PHP is kind of, oh, it's kind of a rule, but mainly a suggestion. Um, the logic exceptions are things that are people are using your stuff wrong in the code itself. So you got to call up, somebody's using your library and they're giving you the wrong kind of arguments. Uh, that one I use a lot, um, the invalid argument exception. There's also the ones that are linked to bad calls. So you have your bad function call exception and your bad method call exception. Uh, if you ever do a call override in any of your classes, that a bad method call is the right exception to throw in that case. Then we have our runtime exceptions. These are things that are actually happening during the class. So a lot of people ask me, so what's the advantage of using, you know, an SPL exception for my stuff instead of coming up with my own ideas of what domain exceptions would be? And the biggest reason is somebody somewhere at some time is going to have to read your code, right? Douglas was talking about this in the, in the keynote. And you want them to be able to very easily understand exactly what it is you're doing. If you're subclassing even these SPL extensions in different ways, that's fine. But they'll be able to look at it and say, oh, this is a, this is a bad me method call exception. I don't have to go look through all their code and see that, that their specific type of exception is that. I can say, oh, I understand why they did this and how they did this, and it's easy for me to use. The other thing is you don't have to totally abandon the method of having some kind of a marker that this exception belongs to this class, the 
The best way to really do that is by using PHP interfaces. So whatever library, whatever you're working on, you have an interface and you implement it in your exception. It can be an empty interface. Just use it as a marker. So you can also catch at the library level. But your actual exception yourself, itself, that domain, that class name there, is giving you the information about what the exception was and what went wrong. So Ralph Schindler wrote this really excellent, excellent uh, article. The link's here if you want to go read it sometime. On this whole concept of how to do these domain type exceptions and how to make it really easy to understand what your code is doing with exception handling. Uh, one of the nice things is the ZF2 library uh, uses these rules in all their exceptions and everything they do. So if you look at the code there, you'll see that they do the marker interfaces for your libraries. You'll see that they have the domain exceptions. They're using SPL exceptions all over the place. So it's really easy to understand the code. Lots and lots of places I go, the number one complaint against PHP that I always hear is, but it's all functional. They don't have a file object. Uh, and it really irritates me a lot because PHP does have a file object. In fact, they have file objects and directory iterator objects and lots of things you can work with. Just because you don't know it's there doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Really. The class in uh, PHP is called SPL file info. This is the main class. And what this actually is, is it's the metadata of a file. So you're going to get all your information as if you would call ctime or atime or, you know, your full path, whatever you're using, okay? These are returned by the directory iterators, which I'll talk about later. But instead of writing your own file object, which a lot of uh, frameworks and things like that have done, there's no reason you shouldn't be subclassing these ones that already exist. So this is a PHP test linter. If you've ever gone and looked at it, it's rather interesting. But one of the things it does is it uses SPL file info when it's going and looking and using all the things in its code. So it can keep this nice object-oriented code that it's using all over the place. It's, it's nice because they don't have to hold a file pointer somewhere in the system. They just have this object that they work with. And it makes it very easy to do whatever you need to do for a file. You can look at the, the metadata of it, or you can actually go and you can open it up using the SPL file info. <laughs> and when I'm talking about opening it up, I'm talking about SPL file object. File info gives you information about an object. The file object is actually an object that represents an open file. You can do streaming and line by line the same way you can with the PHP regular functions, but you're not worried about where's my file pointer, am I making sure I closed it, what's going on with this file. And for those of you who don't like to mix all your procedural and object-oriented stuff, you have a nice object-oriented interface for doing all the same things you do with your regular code. So if you've looked at some of the new versions of Cake PHP, they do this themselves in their uh, CVS import behavior thing, which is really cool. So you'll see here, they're opening a new file info object, and they can go through line by line with get CSV line and take care of whatever they need to do, which is a really fast way of getting it done. All right. Before I go any farther, does anybody have any questions or comments about anything yet? I know it's kind of early in the morning, and I was kind of out late, so I'm a little sleepy as well. All right. So next we're going to talk about one of my favorite things in SPL, which is array object. We're going to talk about specifically array object itself. Array object is an interesting beast because it doesn't implement just one interface. It implements a whole big set of them. So you're going to have array access. So you can take your object and access it with the brackets, just as if it was an array. You can do countable on it. It's an iterator aggregate, so you can go over and over it. 
Um, the new versions of it, it's serializable now instead of blowing up like it used to. It has almost all the array methods, but not all. And the biggest reason for this is the biggest difference between a native PHP array and array object is the concept of order. In your array object, you do not have that concept of things are in here in this order, really. You kind of can rely on it if you're actually using an array in there as storage, but on the other hand, you really can't. So any of your sorting and those kind of things, there are some where you have methods to do that with, but you can't always rely on that behavior. The other thing is you have to use the methods on array object. You can't just take an array object and throw it into most of the array methods and have it work. And uh, I hear from a lot of people, well, why don't we just fix core so you can do that? Um, and the biggest problem is, is, is how would we define what is actually available for that to work? So you say that next works on array objects only or subclasses of array object, but we can't have next work on just something implementing array access because it has no concept of the sort. So lots and lots of things are using uh, array object in their code now because it makes it very easy to take an array and then extend it and give you some different kinds of ideas on how it's going to work inside. This one is a pretty interesting one because it's using a singleton, which may be evil, but it does. It also has some things like a map function, another functionality that isn't available in your main array object. But you can do a lot of really cool things without having to reinvent the wheel. This is really cool because it even has the different, the two, two JSON, two YAML. Uh, I will say one thing, I'm not really going to talk about it a lot in this talk, but in 5.4 there is a new interface called JSON Serializable. Uh, so if you implement that in your class, you don't have to have a specific method to change it to JSON. You can implement the method just like you would implement Serializable, and when you pass it through JSON in code, you'll get whatever JSON you've defined out. Makes life a lot easier, but 5.4 only, and I'm sure everybody's not on 5.4 yet. So next we're going to talk about interfaces. So SPL gives you auto load, it gives you exceptions, it gives you our magic file objects and our magic array object, and it gives you several interfaces that you can implement that help you out in your code. One thing people don't realize is that there is a group of interfaces that are in PHP itself. They're not in SPL, even though they kind of get lumped together with SPL quite a bit. So one of these is traversable. Traversable, you can never do in your own code. Traversable is an engine thing that says, I can do for each, but I don't have the magic iterator methods. Um, you'll see a PDO statement and several other types of extensions like that will implement this one. Then there's iterator. And I hope you all know what an iterator is. Iterator, iterator, iterator. So tonight we'll have a little drinking game, anybody who wants to play along. As we go around talking during the evening, anytime anyone says, Iterator, we all take a drink and we hope we don't fall on the floor by the evening. So Iterator has a lot of uses. One of the most interesting ones I actually found when I was preparing for this talk is somebody's done an MVC framework on top of WordPress, of all things. And so they have a, a post list that extends implement Iterator and does a lot of extra features on it, which is kind of cool. Then we have iterator aggregate. Iterator aggregate is a weird duck. What it says is, somewhere in my class I have an iterator inside. When I ask for each over this object, give me that. That's all it does. So it's very simple to implement and it's used in a lot of places. This particular implementation of it It's pretty interesting because it's holding an array iterator inside, which is something we'll get into later. So a real array in PHP, if you don't know this, underneath at the C level is a hash table and a doubly linked list kind of stuffed together. It's not an array in any way, shape, or form. Nobody knows why it's called an array except the people who actually wrote it. And it's kind of head scratchy because you go to other languages or people who come from other languages and they go, array, yeah, no. It does a lot of things in a very generic manner, 
But when you get down and have really specialized things that you need done, you'll find it falls on its face. And one of the things with Array is it's not a true iterator. So if you have a class that is type hitting on iterator or something like that, you're going to have a lot of problems because arrays aren't technically really iterators. So I have to be very careful with PHP type hints. All right. These are still core interfaces. Um, array access and serializable as well. I talked about array access a little bit. Um, you can go look at that example if you want. It allows you to access the contents of whatever is in the object with your square brackets instead of using different kind of syntax. Uh, the really fun thing to do with array access is to use your object overloader methods and your array access at the same time and have two, di two different uh, ways that the object behaves depending on what you're doing with it. Of course, then you kind of really have to make sure you document because you drive your users nuts. But it's a lot of fun to do cool things like that. Now in PHP 5.3, we have this new closure interface. And it's like traversable. It's merely for the engine. So you need to try and not try to implement it because you will have interesting things happen to you, mainly uh, bad errors being thrown. So let's go over the, <coughs> the interfaces that are actually part of SPL, not the ones that are just part of PHP core and are cool. And the first one of those is countable, which actually surprised me that array access and those are part of core, but countable is not. Because this is the one I probably use more than anything else. So I don't know if any of you use Redis, but this is a pretty cool library that deals with Redis stuff. So they have this nice class where you have a, a list of all your Redis servers. And you'll see it has countable and array access all together. And it allows you to keep track of you know, what's actually inside your uh, list. But the interesting thing here is you'll see what it's actually doing is it's taking a the number of configs you're sending in here and counting them. One interesting thing to do would be to have a different class that maybe only looks for all your active servers or maybe looks for your deleted servers or things like that. When you implement your own countable, you can allow properties in the class to change the way your countable behaves. That may not always be the best thing, but sometimes it's very useful. There are three additional interfaces that SPL provides that I'm not really going to go over until we go over to the actual iterators that it implements. And the reason for that is they are iterator things. You have your outer iterator, wraps around an iterator. You have your inner iterator. And then you have your seekable iterator. And most of those are pretty self-descriptive. There's one more set that I do want to mention, and those are SPL subject and observer. Uh, if anybody does any kind of listeners or, or events or signal handling, whatever you're doing in your code, it is highly suggested that you implement these for the same reason you would use the SPL uh, exceptions. The simple fact that other people look at your code, they can instantly see this and say, oh, I understand the pattern they're using here, and I know how to use it because they've implemented these. It just jumps right out at you. Now we're getting into our actual iterator classes. So SPL gives you these, these interfaces to help with iterators, but they give you ready-to-go iterators themselves. Well, kind of ready-to-go. And the reason I say kind of ready-to-go is because of the first one. The first one is an abstract class. And as far as I know, it's one of the few abstract, if the only abstract classes, provided by PHP itself. The reason is, is because you have to extend it and tell it how to filter your iterator. You'll find that most of these iterator classes, but not all, have a recursive and a regular version of them. So you need to decide when you're using them, am I going to have a situation where I'm going to need to recurse and go inside or not? That will make the decision for which one you use. This is pretty cool. This is a simple filter. It's doing some uh, little preg match magic so that when it does the includes, it does them in a little bit different manner. You'll also see here, these PHP tools are pretty interesting. 
This one is actually looking and doing relative file names and things on it. And then it's taking whatever filter is provided and running it on it, which is very nice. This is one of my favorite things to say, which is iterator, iterator. If you say that three times fast, you will be very drunk if you're at the party. And you will get really tongue-tied. So this is a regular class. Unlike the filter iterator, you don't have to implement it and tell it how to act. It knows how to act already. So basically, this is a magic iterator to make stuff that already does for each be an iterator. So if you have an array and you have this class or this library that you're using and it only takes iterators, you can just stick whatever it is in here and it'll work for the most part. You do need to be very careful with this. So Symphony uses this in its finder. Which is pretty interesting because what it does is it allows you to do the iteration and control and keep track of the depth of what you're doing. So any of these PHP iterators, you can take the basic behavior of how it works and extend them and override just, just one little component of it and make it do what you need it to do simply. So our next one is our array iterator. This is kind of like our iterator iterator in that you can stick something in and it will magically work. In this case, it only takes arrays, whereas the other one can take arrays in anything that does traversable. This has a really dirty trick because you can put an object into it. If you put an object into it, it'll make it work like a standard class and it'll go over the public properties in the class. Append iterator is a little bit newer one. And basically, what you do with this one is you can take a whole bunch of iterators and keep sticking them on the end as you're going through, and it'll just keep going through the stack until you come to the end. You might never come to the end. So this specifically is a, allows you to go searching through files kind of in a glob-like manner using this iterator. Yes, 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 yes. And this is really interesting because what it does is this one is implementing your iterator aggregate that says, I have an iterator inside, come get it. What it's doing is it's building the iterator each time, depending on what the class state looks like. In this case, you can see at the bottom, if it's a simple iterator, it just sends it out. If it's a complex one, it creates it and appends another one on and appends another one on until you have what you need. Now, you do have to be careful with the append iterator because it appends. You can only stick things on the end, and you can't take them off after you stick them on. So make sure this is the specific use case that you're needing it for. Then we have our limit iterator. This is one of my favorite ones. How many of you have ever had an array that you need to get a chunk out of it quickly and easily? This is a very good way to do this. It implements the seekable iterator, which I talked about before, which says, you need to go to this point. And then the limit iterator says, go from here and stop once you get to there. Your offset and your limit. Very simple. I'm not going to all these files because I will run out of time. So we also have our file system iterator. And I didn't talk about directory iterator much, but we do have a directory iterator in PHP, which will iterate over a directory pretty simply. And it will give you SPL file objects and all the things inside. And that's really great, but that's not always what you want. Sometimes you only want the file path. You don't want an object made for everything you're iterating over in the file directory. That would be very painful in some cases. So we have this file system iterator. And the difference between the file system and the directory iterator is there's a set of magic flags and these are actually documented because the PHP SPL documentation is much better than it used to be. But these are documented and you can tell it, only give me the file paths or, or only give me this or only give me that. The other cool thing you can do with this is you can say, give me objects, but give me objects of this class. 
So if you have a custom class that extends SPL file info, it must extend SPL file info, but does something special. You can say, I'm going to iterate over this directory. I want you to give me my objects in this custom object. You can also set the SPL file object, which is when you're opening files to use. So this gives you a lot more flexibility than your regular directory iterator. And we have caching iterators. I really don't like the name for this because it doesn't really do what you think it does. Uh, a more proper name for this might be a look-ahead iterator. What it does is it allows you to peek into what's coming next and decide what you want to do. It also has some caching that it does, but not very much. So everybody's like, well, what would you actually use this for? Um, if you ever know, there's a pretty nice PHP Excel. If you ever have to do Excel with PHP, you know it's a real pain. Uh, this library does a pretty good job of dealing with it. But it uses caching iterator for a lot of its rows and things to decide what to do next when it's building Excel sheets. So if you look down here, you can see it has a It just allows you to go ahead and look and see, yes, I, I'm at the end of my row, so I need to do a specific thing in the file when I create it, so that when I build my, ex my Excel file when I'm done, it's done properly and doesn't blow up on me. Here's the directory iterator that I talked about a little bit. You can walk a directory, but it has a very limited behavior, really. You're going to get an SPL file info back. You can deal with that, but you need to understand that PHP is spinning up a new object every time you go through it. So if you're going to go in and you're going to walk thousands and thousands and thousands of files, make sure you're doing some unsetting, unsetting in those loops. I don't use the and in your for each loop when you start doing that because you're getting an object back already so you don't really need it there and anytime you start going through a for each with an object and you're telling it use this as a reference bad bad things can happen so this you find all over the web almost every framework is using it almost every project is using it and mainly it's for doing the same kind of things. You know, we're opening up a directory and we're going to walk through it. <laughs> so here they're actually copying directory contents from one place to the other. And this could possibly be pretty slow. <laughs> If you do a scan file and you've got a thousand, I mean a scan deer and you've got a huge array of a thousand files, you don't really want to do that either. So this way you can go through one by one, deal with each one as you need to, and then it won't be destroyed at the end of the loop. This is a fairly new iterator in SPL. I think it's 5.4. So it's a recursive tree iterator. It creates an ASCII graphic tree. I'm serious. This is actually in PHP. I don't know how many of you actually have a use case for taking whatever you're doing and creating a tree of it, but it's there and it's available. I actually found a very good use case for this. What they did is they have a abstract exception class that they use, and in one of its display methods, it uses this tree iterator to actually display your traceback information from your exceptions. How many of you have tried to look at the whatever kind of exceptions you're getting back and go, I cannot read that in any way, shape, or form? This is nice because it's doing an ASCII tree for them. You will notice there is only a recursive version of this, not a regular version. All right, next we have our regex iterator. One of the use cases for filter iterator is, you know, deciding how you're going to match whatever you're looking for. How many of you have seen some kind of a preg replace or something like that in a filter iterator? Has anybody used those? It's incredibly common. Please don't use it. We have one built in already. All you have to do is pass it the regex. 
So decide what you need to regex over when you're doing your iterator. Pop it in and go. The problem with using live code is then I have to go and look for the exact point. So we have a regex iterator. We pass it the iterator we're going over and we say, look for this, match it. And that's all you need to do. Now you'll see that it has a, a constant here, get match. There are a couple more constants that you can pass to the iterator that says return the match, return not match, return things like that. So take a look in the documentation. It's got some really great features. And don't write your own. Now there are two really odd iterators in SPL. They're empty and infinite. And when I was first doing this talk, I'm like, you know, those only have one application, right? You're going to use them for testing. Because when else do you need to say, I always have something empty or I always have something that goes on forever? Well, I still think the infinite is really only useful for testing, unless you're doing some kind of an evil, trying to keep things running forever. And in that case, I should hope you're using a while loop or something a little more robust. However, the empty iterator has a really good use case. If you're using a library or you're using something and it's type hitting that iterator, what happens when you start passing it in non-iterator things? It goes, Pfft. even if you have zero results and try passing that in, it'll blow up. If you have to pass it in iterator and you don't really have anything to iterate, pass it an empty iterator. It'll magically work. It's not going to blow up your type hint. And then later on in your code, you can easily see, well, I didn't get any results because this is an empty iterator. So this ended up having a lot more use than I ever expected that it would. Now there are a whole bunch more iterators, but I want to get into the fun data structure stuff yet. So I'm just going to point them out to you a little bit here. There's your parent iterator. There's the no rewind iterator, which is kind of self-descriptive. You just can't rewind it ever. We have multiple iterator, which is not what you think it is. It's kind of like a penned iterator, only you have more control over where you're putting your iterators, and you have a stack, so you can take things on and put things off. We have our glob iterator, which you pass it a glob string, and it gives you back a direct iterator, iterator basically. And then there was lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people writing an abstract filter class that all it did was took a callback to filter by. So now we actually have that built in. Pass it any kind of callback, a closure, a lambda, whatever. If it's callable, pass it in and you can filter by it. That way you don't have to keep writing that over and over again. I've seen a lot of people say, well, why didn't they do this in the per first place? And the reason is, is because this is the best use case when you have something that is dynamically changing all the time. If you're just being lazy and don't want to write a class for something you're doing the filter by every single time, don't be lazy, write the class. But if you've got something that's going to have a different kind of filter that needs to be applied to it five different ways, then the callback iterator is really the way to go. All right, I have to ask because I want to see the hands. How many of people here are still using PHP 5.2? A few? Well, you can go to sleep then. The next part here is 5.3 only code, and 5.4 actually. So you're only going to see the really cool things if you're able to use 5.3. If you're still on 5.2, I'm very sorry. For a while, I was supporting a project only on 5.2, and every time I would type something, I'm like, oh, that doesn't work. I have to rewrite that again. So we're going to talk a little bit about a doubly linked list. Okay, so we have a collection of values. They're linked to the element before, and they're linked to the element after. So you can look both ways and see where you're going. And the big thing about a doubly linked list is the most important part of a doubly linked list is, of course, the order, how things are ordered and how you move in order from one step to the other. So data structures in PHP and SPL basically said there are a lot of really cool data structures out there in computer science that PHP doesn't support. We have our little uh, array, hybrid, hash table, doubly linked list thing. And it works for almost all the code we're doing. But you're going to run into use cases, very specific use cases. This data structure stuff, 
you need to try it with the array first. I'm going to say that right now. Try it with the array. If you're having performance issues or it's not doing what you want it to do, then go look at the data structure stuff. But don't just use the data structure stuff because they're new and shiny. One thing a lot of people don't realize with these is you're only going to see like performance improvements and things like that at scale. So if you have a small site that only gets a million hits a day or less than that, you're probably not going to gain much by going out and implementing all the new shiny data structure things. But if you've got a site that gets a lot more than that, you can see some real performance improvements. All right, so the SPL, we have a doubly linked list in SPL. And I'm going to say don't use it. It really doesn't do a lot for you. The doubly linked list was really implemented in SPL because there are a couple of specific things we'll talk about in a moment that extend it, that give it more functionality, that make it useful. It's basically there as a base class. That being said, there are a few people who are actually using it. Maybe not in the best way possible, but I was surprised to see it there. Now, the reason this one's using it, if I can get down to that point, excuse me. If you get down to that point and look a little bit farther, you'll see that he changes the way the link, the SPL double link list goes. It can go in two directions. You can iterate forward or you can iterate backward. That's one of the strong points in the doubly linked list. So he changes the direction dynamically, which is actually one of the few, maybe that would be useful. I think personally I would just have two different objects depending on what you're doing. Depends on what you're storing and what you're doing. So stacked on top of an SPL doubly linked list is our SPL stack. Okay? Last in, first out. Stick it on the bottom, take it off the top. So there's a really cool mode when you create this SPL stack that will delete stuff as you go through it. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I use this, now I gotta take it off the stack. You can just iterate through it, and as you iterate through it, it's popping stuff off the stack. And if you, when you're doing your iteration, you find new stuff you need to put on, you can just keep sticking it on the bottom. And it'll just keep going until your stack is empty. So here's a really good example of how to use this, and this is a task pump, which should be pretty self-explanatory. Now you'll see they take the uh, the little the approach that I talked about earlier. We have SPL stacked, which is in last and first out, one we'll get to in a moment, which is SPL queue, and they have two versions of them, so you can go in either direction, which is interesting. All right, so let's go to our SPL queue. I really need to get a remote, but this is a new laptop. So our data is in first in, first out. So you're stacking stuff on and you're taking it right off again. This is really nice. The most interesting use case I found for this is this faux thread pool. So what he's actually doing is he's uh, keeping a, a queue of processes and then passing a, a PHP task to them, which is really an interesting way to do it. He's using a fork or other dirty methods because any kind of uh, parallel processing in PHP can be very difficult. Uh, the other data structure that PHP has is a heap. So this is not heap like heap memory storage. This is heap like the data structure. So what you do is you're passing elements into it and it compares it to the others and it puts it on the pile depending on how it compares to the other items. So when you're done, you kind of have a, a, a heap of stuff that's stored. The SPL heap base class is an abstract class. So you have to implement it and tell it how you want to compare elements to store them. Uh, this is a really cool, if you get a chance, go look at this. This is a lib sprite and it does CSS sprites really cool. There are two implementations in PHP, actually there's three implementations of SPL heap, I'll get into that in a moment, but there's two of them that are direct descendants of that class, and it's min heap and max heap. So, as it states, they compare to look for the minimum to decide where it goes, or they look for the maximum to decide where it goes. And so what you do is you put things on, and it's going to sort it and put it in a location, and then you can iterate through in some kind of order. Uh, if any of you have ever heard of the, the A star 
um, pathfinding implementation. This is actually a PHP version of it, which I never expected to see. But he's using, uh, totally in Russian, he's using the heap stuff in there to help him do the, the mapping. It's pretty cool. You can do complicated stuff in PHP if you really want to. This is the one that is interesting to me. So SPL priority queue in PHP is weird. It doesn't actually extend the stack. It extends the heap. And it is actually a max heap underneath. And so if any of you have ever used it, you know that it has some issues when you have two items that are identical because it doesn't handle them in a deterministic nature. Uh, SPL fixed array. So we actually have a real array underneath to store data, which means that it can take up a lot less memory. Because in PHP, in a regular array, you have your hash table and your doubly linked list, and it takes up quite a bit of memory. Your fixed array underneath is just an array. So some things you need to be careful of. It's not necessarily going to be faster. It will probably take less memory. It can be faster for creation time. In fact, it can be much faster for creation time. So if you need to iterate through 10,000 objects and you're shoving them in and you want to take the smallest amount of memory and make it as fast as possible, that's great. Just remember when you actually start iterating through it, it's not going to be any faster. That's not where you're going to gain the speed and performance. So we also have SPL object storage. Uh, this can be used for two use cases. It can be used as a set of objects. You stick an object in. You can only have one of any object in it because you're basically using the object as the key, key value store. Then you can also actually store something that relates to that object and get it back out again using the object as the key. Oh, and of course the internet is going to fail me. So this is a pretty interesting version of this. It's using DOM node instances inside your SPL object storage, which is pretty clever, because then he's not creating lots and lots and lots of DOM objects, which if you ever use them in PHP, you know that can get pretty heavy and pretty memory consuming. So this way, he has a set, basically, of objects. And he's not making more and more and more. So those are the basics of SPL and some interesting ways and pitfalls for how to use them. But SPL and PHP, you know, we are not a designed language. In fact, I was trying not to laugh too much at the keynote. Not because it wasn't great, but every time he said language designer, I was like, ha ha. PHP is not a designed language. It is an evolving language, and it's evolved by the users. So if there are things that you want to see in PHP, there is an RFC system where you can go and put in your ideas and, and vote on things. And if you go look there right now, there are a lot of great ideas already sitting there to look at. SPL is a great place to kind of get started if you really want to get into the internal stuff. Think of a cool idea, something you really would like to use that would be useful for other people and get involved with it. I know myself there are a couple of things that aren't in SPL that I would like to see in SPL more data structures, more standard interfaces. Maybe somebody really wants to do more iterators, although there are so many already, I don't know that we need any more. But maybe you have that fantastic idea, that fantastic use case. Uh, if you go to wiki.php.net, that is the place to go and look at the RFCs and what's going on in the community. Now, when I started this talk many years ago, uh, the SPL documentation was Absolutely horrific. Now it is much, much better, but we can always use examples, use cases, things like that. Edit.php.net is PHP's online document editor. You'll have to know a little bit of XML to use it. But if you go and edit the docs, and they're good, and you say submit, the docs guys will look at it, and you'll have stuff in the PHP manual with your name on it. So it's a great way to easily get involved. Uh, the other thing is SPL isn't while it's picking up speed and I'm seeing it used more and more, I'm one of those people who would love to see it used everywhere. So I never, ever, ever have to run into the use case where somebody's doing Scandier and I'm getting 10,000 files or, or somebody is uh, reinventing the wheel for the millionth time. 
or you're throwing some kind of exception, and I'm like, that should really be a bad method call exception. And I have to look 10 files down to find it. Anything that improves that is great. Um, I would like to see more articles on people using it and how to use it. And it would be great to see some from a be beginner's or intermediate perspective. Last but not least, here's my plug. I work for Mojo Live, if you've ever gone and seen it. Uh, it's for helping progress your career, kind of like LinkedIn, only not with leaky passwords. <clears throat> so this is the beta code for anybody here who's a DPC or any friend you want to give it to. If you go and enter this in the, the beta sign-up box, you can have an account and try it out. All right, these are the different ways to contact me. Please go to LinkedIn and rate this talk. Um, I'm kind of thinking this might hopefully be the last time I give an SPL talk. But then again, you guys may come up with something great new that I just have to come tell people about. Um, I'm also on Freenode all the time. If you want to talk about something or have a comment or whatever, I'm always glad to make new friends. And, and I do teach people extension writing. So if you're really brave, come give me a holler. And that's all. DPC Radio is a production of iBuildings. The materials presented are copyright of the speakers. This episode is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 2.0 license. iBuildings is a full-service web development company specializing in PHP development. For more information on how we can help you with your next web project, visit our site at iBuildings.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us again for DPC Radio.